This conference will now be recorded. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, today we are here to speak about uh, the Addington SNCE renewals job that was carried out during the Christmas break. And uh, this is one of the complex SNCE in Scotland. Uh, this was also the first type of installation in the United Kingdom uh, with the longest uh, NR60 Mark II head switches and NR60 switch diamond and Unistar being used on the main line for the first time uh, in UK. Uh, so uh, just before I move on to the uh, crux of this uh, talk today, uh, I'll just brief you on the high level agenda today. So first uh, I'm going to speak about uh, uh, some background information and uh, initial development and then move on to options development that was considered during the CRIP3 stage and uh, we'll, bit, uh, we'll spend a bit more time on the single options uh, and, and, and we'll move on to construction and finish off with a summary. Uh, so moving on uh, with the background, I hope uh, many of the uh, audience here would know where the job is located, but for those who don't know, Addingston is located in Scotland near Glasgow and 11 kilometers east of Glasgow. <clears throat> the junction itself is formed by the intersection of two ELRs, uh, one from Motherwell, uh, the WCML from Motherwell and uh, Holy Town lines from Belchil. <clears throat> Excuse me. The existing track layout is a double junction. You could see in the image below, the junction is, uh, it's, it's not very clear, but uh, you can see the uh, junction here. It is, it's a double junction and it is about 300 meters away from the Addington station. And you can also see there are two overbridges within the worksite. To speak about the existing layout, the existing layout as I said, is a double junction formed by uh, two HV switches, uh, 41 points and 42 points, and a switch diamond, 43 AB points. <clears throat> the head switches is required to maintain the speed of 90 miles per hour on the WCML, and uh, the EGS1, which is the Holy Town Lines, is uh, 65 miles per hour. As I as I said before, this is one of the complex junction, and uh, uh, it's no wonder it comes with uh, many complexities. <clears throat> uh, the first one being uh, the, the junction itself is positioned uh, in a deep cutting about uh, uh, five to eight meters. As you can see, all this area in the satellite image is is on cutting, which brings us with the with the drainage problems. Uh, <clears throat> And also in this photo, you can see the retaining walls on the both both sides. Uh, the, the retaining walls are about uh, five meters high, which restricts the track uh, to do a lot of optioneering. Uh, the, the existing layout itself is a timber layout. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, it, it, uh, the, the Swiss diamond is not tampable. And due to that, uh, Obviously, the geometry is in very poor condition. Uh, the factors that contributes to the renewals are uh, the life expired material, uh, poor geometry, drainage issues, uh, <clears throat> and whatnot. Excuse me, my throat. Uh, just moving on, uh, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Liam to speak speak about the initial SSC development that was happening for the last uh, two years. Hi, Liam, uh, would you mind? Uh... Yeah, thanks, Satish. Um, the development of Oddingston was quite complex. Um, we started earlier as it was uh, identified as a landmark site within the control period. The initial walkout for the site happened July 2018 uh, with the Network Rail Track Development Team under Derek Coyne. There was a, 
multi multiple of uh, complexities within the site. Um, the first issue was the presence of a large section of Japanese knotweed, which you can see in the uh, the picture on the right hand side, the sort of brown coloured area. Um, we had to then, in the discovery of this, uh, introduce uh, the spraying and slit trench program. The next issue uh, we encountered was obviously the sheet piling that um, Satish mentioned. Uh, this closes the site off uh, quite very, it makes it very restrictive to the gear off cranes that we use. The initial plan that we were looking at was using the bigger cranes in terms of the, the 810s and the 1200s, but the back ballast on the cranes would mean that it would strike the sheet pile walls, so it meant that we had to reduce the, the scope of the Kirov down to the Kirov 250s. Um, this meant changing the the attack area of how we actually install this SNC. The next two um, problems are sort of combined. The first one was that the, the area, even though it was a, the summer months, it was absolutely sodden, um, and there was quite clearly a drainage issue. Um, that culminated with the the fact that it is below ground, uh, like Satish mentioned, anywhere between six and eight metres in places, um, means that there was a, a drainage element within the initial PRS, but this became very important to pull this forward. Um, so we had to remove this from the spec and we brought this uh, drainage. You can actually see it on the picture on the right hand side that was installed approximately a year before the SNC. Um, we also had to start thinking about the fact that we're going to be as deep below ground level that we were likely to um, have to start thinking about formation treatments right from the very beginning and that any drainage wouldn't alleviate or would only alleviate um, any formation treatment that was coming. As we worked through um, into 2019 and 2020, um, it became evident that the skill set up here had never dealt with anything the size of H switches before, with them being the largest in the country. Um, the historic knowledge that we had within the the, the company didn't allow us um, to really produce a plan that was worthwhile. So I went down to Crewe and to Doncaster and tied in with my, uh, my colleagues down there, and we were able to come up with a plan using um, other sites that have been done that aren't identical but are fairly similar to this site in terms of, I think it was Corton and Oxford, um, to use them as databases to build um, a plan for this site. Moving into the later half of 2020, um, we had to start pulling together the wagon requirements and the, the Kirov allocation uh, for the site. By this point, we were starting to get a lot of design information and feedback on the GI and any slit trench information that we've been doing for the Japanese knotweed. So at this point, you can see the, the diagram down the bottom. Um, it was then introduced to us that we'd be doing a 200 mil sand blanket that incorporated geocells. The geocells were an added complication because we'd never done them at this point up here. Um, we had one plain line site that was on the horizon, uh, which was done before Uddingston, that would give us some experience of using it, but it was an added complication that we didn't have any experience. So through the, the latter half of 2020 and into the beginning of 21, we had to do a lot of trials with the, the manufacturer um, and start to sort of refine how we were going to build this job um, as we went along. Working our way into 2021, uh, we started tying in with the production teams and more importantly with the SNC manufacturer, who was by early 21 starting to produce draft 150s, which were um, absolutely instrumental in this job uh, being able to go ahead. We had started to look at how we were going to um, use the Kirovs, and the best way to do this was to have the, the concrete bearers used as the double split layout. This meant slightly modifying how we delivered the SNC um, to site. 
the initial plan was to lever as much as possible on the tilters, uh, but that slowly morphed into um, there's still slightly more by tilters, but quite a lot of road deliveries were going to have to come because of the centre sections uh, and the switch diamonds as well, not being able to come uh, on tilting wagons. But at this point, we'd also nailed down uh, the methodology of how we actually get the, the switch panels themselves uh, to site. So the switch panels need to be broken up into three plain line panels with the switches themselves removed and brought on separate wagons. Uh, this added another difficulty in that Network Rail had uh, none of the wagons available uh, within the fleet to accommodate the switches of this size. Um, so Network Rail had to go out to the industry and go to British Steel and actually go and source IGA wagons. Um, so this was all done in collaboration with the, the teams down at Milton Keynes and the, the modular teams within Network Rail's um, overarching structure. So by July 2021, uh, the site was handed to the production team. Um, we had, I think at that point, we had a, a really good Form B from the Arcadis team within the lines, and we had a, a fairly robust 1 to 50. Um, and then it was over to the production team to, to finish it off and make sure it was delivered. I think that's, I think that's me, Satish. Yeah, thank you, Liam. <clears throat> no problem. So moving on, uh, look into the options that was developed as part of this design. Uh, even though the PRS required the design to be NR60, NR60 was not developed at the stage of uh, the options study. Uh, the options study was uh, obviously developed by Network Rail Design Delivery. And uh, at the same time, uh, Milton Keynes was working on the development of SNC along with the manufacturer Progress Rail. So uh, the, the best option for the NRTD was to go with the, uh, the design of vertical switches, at least for the purpose of the design, because uh, even though the uh, NR60 Mark II layout is not identical to the uh, Sen56 layout, it is more or less the same. And on that basis, NRDD was progressed the uh, options with the NR56. Just in case uh, you were wondering uh, why we are using NR60 Mark II here, uh, 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 most of the people uh, you might know the the NR60 is is a more robust design uh, that is being utilized uh, UK wide just now, and uh, the the reason is being uh, the design of NR60 Mark II is pretty much uh, identical to the Sen56 layout, which allows for the like-for-like -like renewals, whereas the Mark I or RT60 uh, layout, uh, which was the first version of uh, Sen60 uh, SNC, uh, is not identical with uh, Sen56 layout. Uh, and, and with a site like Addingston, where you are pretty much constrained uh, with all the retaining walls and stuff, you, you need to pretty much renew like for like. So proceeding on to option one, uh, the option one, uh, I've, I've just drawn a schematic here just to make it uh, very clear. I've, uh, I've got a snippet here from the drawing, uh, but just to reduce the clutter, I've, I've, uh, I've drawn a schematic here. So for the first option, the consideration was to have WCML as the main line and uh, designing the Holy Town line as Turner Road. But doing so uh, will, res will result in a contraflexure turnout and a flat curve at the diamond location, uh, which is not very preferential for a complex layout like this, which, uh, which resulted uh, in the option two, in option two, EGS1, uh, which is Holy Town line, was considered as the main line, and WCML as the Turner route. The WCML obviously uh, requires a speed of 90 miles per hour, and hence uh, the head switches, which allowed for a turnout speed of 90 miles per hour. 
having uh, the Holy Town line as the main line allowed the designer to have a straight on the through route for the switches and uh, for the diamond, ultimately allowing for the standard design. <clears throat> Moving on to option three. Option three is uh, kind of similar to option two, except for the fact that the down main have been extended through the station platform uh, due to uh, the poor aid reported by maintenance. And uh, there were no other options considered, like a, a ladder arrangement or a, or a different sort of uh, junction. The reason being that the, the junction itself is is pretty much restrictive uh, to change the layout of the of the double junction. So uh, the like for like double junction was considered best solution. And we'll move on to a single option, and uh, I'll, I'll invite David to present the single option. Yeah, thanks, Tish. Hi, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, so, Satish says, um, so option two, um, the option two proposal um, for the full NR60 layout, it was the one that was selected. Um, we only made some minor tweaks outside the SNC to the Grip 3 option. Um, I think that's probably testament to the amount of early design development that was done. Um, one thing that's quite counterintuitive is uh, the main, what, is considered to be the main line in railway terms. The West Coast main line is actually the turnout route, and the Holy Town lines, uh, which are the, the the branch effectively, is the through line, um, and that caused quite a bit of head scratching um, at various times in the project for different disciplines. Um, next slide, please, Satish. So NR60 was the um, the preferred option, um, but the problem that we had. Um, with Uddingston was the NR60 Mark II switch diamond uh, was the first of its type and was still under development uh, when we started the GRIP4 design process. Um, because of this, um, we had to have a backup option um, of having an NR60 layout but with an uh, NR56 switch diamond in there. So we always had that uh, upper sleeve in the background that is something that might have to be used. Um, although that would have presented some construction challenges of itself uh, with the change between inclined and vertical uh, rail sections in the vicinity of the switch diamond. Um, we, ha we didn't have an REPW drawn to start with um, on the job. Um, and we, during the design process, we received the draft REPW and that allowed us to then progress the GRIP4. Um, based on the manufacturer drawings, based on the first principles. Next slide, Satish, please. And so this slide just shows um, an extract from um, the final manufacturer drawings, um, side by side with our track GA drawing. Um, so there's two panels uh, shown on here. Um, on the Uddingston job, we had 26 panels in total. So it's an enormous job. Um, and what, what we did, sorry, Satish, I'm still on that slide. That's okay. Um, we also overlaid, once we overlaid, we were able to put the outline of the panels onto our GA drawing. Um, I think that was helpful to the construction team when it came to planning the job, because um, you could see exactly where the panels fell in relation to other assets on the job. Okay, Satish. So throughout this project, the project of the size, um, we had to have continuous collaboration between uh, all the colleagues in the other design disciplines. That was essential to the success of the job. Um, slightly more challenging because of the, the working from home situation we were in because of the COVID pandemic, but we made it work. So in, a, in addition to the sort of day-to-day -day collaboration that was going on all the time, we also had three formal interdisciplinary reviews um, to ensure that all the the designs from each discipline tied in together. Um, part of that was using um, 3D software, um, like you can see in the in the snapshots there from a, a product called iTwin. Uh, and in this instance, it's showing the existing drainage runs, the assets, and, and how 
um, they clash or, or not with um, planned assets that are going into the job. Um, so that was that was quite handy. And the uh, next slide, Satish. Um, so I'll just flag up um, some interface issues that we had. Um, one of the primary interface issues we had was the existing drainage, and because the job's in a deep cutting, um, we, the, the, the drainage all the way through the job. Um, on the left-hand example, um, there's a fairly shallow existing UTX uh, under the West Coast Main Line, um, and it's shallow enough um, that it was clashing with our construction depth. Um, and the way the way we got around that was just having a short interruption of the geocell layer, um, just so that um, that clash was removed. Uh, on the right-hand example, um, you can see there's a, a catch pit which is very tight to the the end of the bearers, the existing bearers um, on the S and C. Um, when we overlaid overlaid the, the proposal. Um, we found that um, because the, the bearers in the NR60 Mark II were a bit longer, um, that situation was going to become even worse. So the resolution there was place that catch pit with a rotting eye. Um, there was other parts of the job where we had the same situation, but on plain line sleepers. In those instances, we were able to um, remove that risk um, by putting in short-ended sleepers instead. Next slide, Satish. So this was another interface issue. This was on the whole town lines, um, fairly large sloughs to, towards the outside of the curve um, of up to 300 millimetres. Um, and we had a troughing route on the up whole town cess um, that we were a bit concerned about that might well be damaged. What we were able to do here was uh, relocate the cables that were in that trough onto the, the elevated troughing route um, that's attached to the retaining wall there. And remove the the troughing route, so that got rid of that issue. Next slide, please, Satish. Um, so the stressing on the job, um, the, the the new layout was fully stressed uh, within the eight-day blockade. Um, there's some key differences in stressing NR60 Mark II compared to other types. Um, we had to have a predetermined sequence that we developed um, in advance of the job. Um, there was no stress transfer blocks in NR60 Mark II, and the stress indicator um, is at the toe of the SNC rather than at the heel, which is with the ball and claw arrangement and other types. And you can see the table there that shows the sequence of pools, and we had the, the diagram above that, and um, that was on our GA drawn as well. Next slide, please, Satish. Um, so, uh, Addingston's on the West Coast Main Line um, and has a through alignment design th through it, as with the rest of the route. Um, and it, that stretches from North London to just outside Glasgow. Um, so, with this job, um, we had to receive we received um, the through alignment design information from Milton Keynes, um, and that gave us enough information to determine whether or not we could uh, put the the, the alignment onto the, or sorry, if we could tie the the new alignment into the TAD. Um, but what we found is that the, the existing TAD was actually quite far removed um, from the existing position of the junction uh, and also Addingston Station. So what we found is that we were best to propose a new TAD alignment through the junction, um, which we could then um, share with Milton Keynes, showing how it tied into the existing TAD, um, and they approved that in advance of the job. And this last slide for me just shows you um, the time scales um, of the job uh, from the GRIP3 uh, handover in summer of 2020, right through to the, the last tamp in the job, which was in February just past there. Um, so quite a substantial period of time with a number of different stages, quite a quite a challenging job. But we managed to uh, hit T minus ten for the proof for construction, so we were, were quite pleased with that. Is that from you, Satish? Thanks, David. Uh, um, 
having said about uh, the dis uh, design there, uh, we'll move on to construction. Uh, and uh, I'll just brief about uh, some of the construction highlights. Uh, the work was completed in a eight day blockade during Christmas 2021. Uh, to complete this job, uh, we required 21 engineering trains, which was about 40% of the total train available in uh, UK two SSC tampers uh, and two kilo cranes for lifting all the uh, panels and stuff. Uh, and, and 17 tilting wagons were used to deliver the job. In addition to this, uh, IGA wagons uh, from British Steel was used to deliver the hitch switches, as Liam was mentioning there. So in, the, in this job, uh, we have delivered two NR60 MAR2 head switches and one SN60 switch diamond. Also, uh, there is a huge number of uh, uh, plane line was renewed, uh, about 628 yards of plane line was renewed and further 507 yards of uh, plane line was re-railed uh, just purely because uh, the site was uh, having issue with the RCF. 130 uh, wells were completed in total, and uh, some of them being NR60 Mark II specific ones, uh, where uh, the welding strategy was uh, not fully developed, and uh, copper plates have to have to be used to, to align the wells. And this was a hundred back at line speed after the first week tamp. One of the key thing that was a uh, critical uh, when it comes to construction is the large dig depth and the geo cells just for uh, those who are uh, who are not uh, uh, familiar with geo cells uh, these are the geo cells here and uh, it is being filled with sand uh, by the site tippers uh, so site tippers were used to uh, get the large amount of sand into the site and the working methodology was was that the doser proceed from one end to other uh, to to level the sand such that it does not damage the geo cells. The other, other uh, critical thing, as I said, was uh, the large tick depth uh, uh, amounting for about uh, 600 millimeters to 900 millimeters, including the geo cells. Uh, so uh, as David was mentioning earlier, uh, the, some of the catch bits were very close to the uh, track uh, due to the fact that it is uh, restricted on either side by the retaining wall. Uh, and rebar was used to uh, restrain all the uh, catch pits during this uh, high digs uh, for the site. And one one more thing we uh, did was to reduce the uh, cross fall to one in forty, so that uh, we could uh, reduce the uh, ballast required at the at the ends of the sleeper. The, the reason being the SNC bearers are are, are too long. And uh, moving on, <clears throat> GPS guided doses were used to install the formation and ballast to the required level. So, uh, so obviously the, the design strings have been translated to uh, a workable uh, uh, construction uh, strings uh, with the help of a Trimble Business Center, uh, where it is all converted to surfaces and then the uh, doser was guided by GPS to achieve all those design levels, and there was no issue reported back on this one. So you can see the uh, there are some screens, uh, screenshots for uh, uh, the the Trimble Business Center. So one more thing uh, uh, was uh, Unistar being the first of its kind to be used on the main line. Uh, it required training for. Uh, for for the Alliance staff and the network rail staff. And this training was conducted in a Portobello yard in, in Edinburgh and, and the uh, Swiss diamond was brought to Edinburgh uh, and, and the training was imparted uh, to, to all the staff members and uh, sent back to uh, uh, Beeston. So you can see this, these are the Unistar uh, point operating equipment there. 
when it comes to SNC manufacturing, there were quite a few challenges manufacturer has to face uh, in order to achieve this design. Some of them being uh, uh, obviously uh, the manufacturer have to develop uh, a novel design for the head switches and and the sh shallow depth switch diamond uh, because it's a, a new design. Manufacturer has to take into account the safe passage of uh, wheel flange, wheel flange on the switch diamond, minimizing the likelihood of flange claim, unnecessary high impacts by reducing the dip angles. Uh, so all the components are uh, are new components, and uh, and this all has to be uh, approved by Network Rail, and and for that the manufacturer has to advance their design. Uh, well in advance. Okay, so given the volume and the, the size of the panel, a manufacturer has to utilize different delivery strategies. The heads which is being 41.6 meter long and for nearly 40 tons cannot be transported via the tilting wagon. And therefore they have to work around that. So, I'll, sorry. So for that, uh, the trans manufacturer has to split the head switches into three plain line panel and design all the base plates and components uh, to, to uh, fit a plain line uh, on the panel to be transported to the side via tilting wagon to to optimize the production, and then uh, they and then the uh, the switch half switch, which came via IGA wagon, have, was was then built on site. Be, because of that, it it amounted for uh, extra work for uh, uh, rebuilding the SNT and regaging the S SNC. Uh, so you could see the manufacturer drawing here. Uh, so they have split the switch panel into three uh, plain line panel and uh, it was transported to uh, the site via tilting wagon you can see the uh, switch rails are missing but then uh, uh, the, the plain line panel uh, the plain line rails were uh, fitted into these panels and uh, it enabled all the site machines to uh, go on that for on the temporary basis and, and then the switch panels were installed you can see on this photograph uh, the switch rails being installed uh, on the site uh, this is something uh, different than the other sites usually uh, all the all the uh, panels will be fitted and uh, come to site uh, with all the stuffs but not on the site due to the complexity of the it's just, <clears throat> and another uh, another important aspect uh, is the safety on the site. You could uh, imagine how busy the site could be uh, with the with the volume of the works that is involved uh, in delivering this. Uh, three shifts each day for eight day blockade, with typically ten to thirty operatives. 21 engineering trains come into and go out of the site. Two SNC tampers were used to uh, do the, do all the tamping works. So two, two kilogram were used to uh, lift all the panels. 17 tilting wagons used to uh, get the plain line panels here. Four road rail vehicles were used. Three excavators, one GPS guided dozer, and various types of small plants. It's, in spite of all these things, uh, there were no injuries reported, and uh, this really serves as a testament for uh, the robust planning that has taken place on site. So, uh, just to summarize on on the on this job, uh, so as I said before, this is first of type NR60 Mark II head switches and switch diamond installed in UK. Unistar uh, point operating equipment has been first utilized on the main lines. 
the double junction is now fully tampable. Geocell have been installed to uh, counteract the drainage issues. The, the layout itself is fully accessible now. So because of all these uh, things, the, the geometry have been massively improved, resulting in a better traces less maintenance interventions is required now uh, and in, in fact uh, it, it all amounts for a better passenger experience and uh, I, would, I would say there are a lot of people have been involved in the site uh, for successfully delivering this you know for last couple of years starting with the SEC manufacturer and uh, Milton Keys NRDD and the Alliance partners to deliver these jobs successfully. And uh, I would rather finish with a time-lapse video just to uh, give you a glimpse of uh, the work that has taken place. I'll try to clip that. As you can see, this is a massive job successfully delivered by a great team. Uh, and uh, I would now uh, say a big thanks for you to listening into uh, our presentation today. And uh, we'll open up for any questions today. Thanks. Thanks a lot to Satish, Liam and David for that. That was excellent. Um, I've got a few questions on the chat, which I'll run past you if you're ready for that. and. Also, at this point, I'll just encourage everyone and um, just remind you to drop any questions you have into, into the chat there. So if I just start at the, the top here. So a question from Stuart Spears. He's asking how much did the geometry differ between the Send 56 vertical and the Mark II NR60? Was the alteration minimal? It, 
the alteration was minimal. Uh, uh, it's uh, the toe to nose dimension didn't change too much from the NS56 layout. I think, uh, if, if I'm correct, uh, just give me a second. I think uh, the toe to nose dimension was uh, 90.2 in SN56, and here it is like 90.5. So it's not a huge change from the SIN56 layout. When it came to the switch diamond, um, the the geometry was identical for all intents and purposes um, between NR56 to NR56 sort of hybrid option and, and what we finally achieved. And that's what gave us the sort of confidence to proceed, despite the fact that um, the NR60 Mark II switch diamond hadn't yet been confirmed. And we were able to proceed knowing that we had that in the background. Excellent, thank you. Um, got another one here from Jim Watson. He's asking, um, given the switch size, was consideration given to spares and a nearby stillage? Uh, yes, okay. of course. Uh... Um, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sirish. The the spares and the, the stillage were considered pretty much from the beginning. There was a lot of talk with uh, Jeff McGee and Eric Thompson regarding this. Um, and the maintainer was eventually brought in and the, the consideration was uh, more along the, the lines of if it broke, how quickly could we get replacement parts? And it, it was just unfeasible to not have some of these parts on site. Um, there wasn't anywhere within um, the local area that these could really be stored, so they had to be stored on site. So the, the main uh, spares were there was a, a pair of half switches uh, delivered to the site and they're lying in the cestus now. Um, and the switch diamond panel had a replicant, an entire panel um, rebuilt, and that's also on site. So that they are the main components. There's also a lot of uh, the S and T equipment and stuff like that, that was given directly to the maintenance. Right, thanks, Liam. Um, also, another one from Jim is asking: um, Given the length of the lead rails, was stressing considered as part of the rail joint design? Yes, we did consider the stressing between the switches. Yeah. Okay, and uh, just a follow on from that, I guess. So Jim's asking, how were the lead rail stressed? Was it tensors or rail warmers? Not done with tensors. Yeah, with tensors. No, nah, it tensors. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, one here from Stuart Corey is ask, asking, were any temporary works required for the dings in front of the sheep piles? I'm not sure. I don't think sheep piles were installed as part of this job. I don't know, sure. No, the, the, the sheep piles were existing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, one from uh, Shane Harris here, I think it says, uh, if anyone would like any information on Unistar HR point machines or have any questions, please let me know. So thanks for that. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, a comment from Angus just saying the time lapse is very useful and captures the tight constraints of the sheet pile wall and the retaining wall. And uh, Russell Kimber is uh, asking, well, firstly saying great presentation and quite an accomplishment, well done all. And then he asks, did you have any practical issues with the geo cells being locally crushed during the sand infill process? Um, no, the, the sand infill uh, came from Paul Coyne, who was a uh, the lead engineer on the site. They, um, he'd actually done something similar uh, down south and near Coventry, I think it was. Um, and that was why the slide that Satish had with the side tuples uh, proved to be quite fruitful. So rather than have excavators try to push out and load sand um, as we normally would on a normal site, the methodology of just dumping the sand and then pushing it with the, the dozer was uh, the best methodology. There wasn't any uh, issues with crushing, uh, and we had spoken to the manufacturer of the uh, the actual GSL. It was just more uh, a case of the practicality of could we control um, the blade of the 
the dozer without damaging the um, the geocells. Uh, and the way the geocell is made up, the geocell was 150 mil um, in height, and then there's a 50 mil layer added on top of uh, the geocells <coughs> that makes up the 200 mil layer. Um, and that was quite crucial in making sure that we didn't damage it. Excellent. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The, the, the way the, the the way the dozer operations happened was that um, the blade was filling the geocells as it went. So by the time the the, the way the dozer went over the geocells, it was stable. That was the principle yeah. of it. At the very start of it, uh, there was a vertical cut in the formation, and the geocells were placed in a vertical cut. So that when the, the guys come down, you can right onto the right onto the top of it. There wasn't any. The in other interface, so it worked quite well. Yeah, thanks, Willie. Yep. Okay, another uh, a, a comment that I would echo from from Craig Gemmel was just saying, um, you know, given the the nature of the the heavy work bank that's in the alliance, we don't have much time generally to to bask on the glory of it. And he's just saying that thanks to tonight's presentation, it just shows you how much. Of a well-planned and executed job it was, and, and the kind of vast scale of it as well. So, yeah, I'd, I'd echo that too. Uh, question from Shweep here. Uh, he's asking. Um, my screen's just moving about there. Sorry. Were there any adjustments to the existing catch pits? Did you have to replace them in a different location? Yes, yeah, Satish. Uh, Shweep brother. Um, we, we did. We, ha we had to replace some of the catch pits um, with an S and C area um, with rodding eyes uh, where they were too tight, um, and in the sort of plate line sections, we also had a couple of instances where um, instead of having a G forty four sleeper, we had a short ended um, sleeper um, to increase the clearance between the edge of the catch pit and the, the edge of the sleeper. Brilliant, yeah. Yeah. And we did check the rents as well. Yeah. Sorry, Satish, what was that? I know and, and we checked the runs of the uh, catch bit between uh, between the rolling high, you know, when we replaced the rolling high, it's not a uh, uh, contract the flow of the water. So yeah, if we did yeah, that's that right. Also. Yeah, the great the grade of the, the drainage runs and wells were <coughs> were altered. Um, it was just the catch pit was directly replaced with a rodding eye. Yeah, I think it definitely showed the benefits of using the eye twin, didn't it? Just to because of UTX as well, as well as the catch pits that were all able to be uh, to be replicated 3D and and we could suss all that out beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A comment there from Angus was just saying, uh, I think we can all appreciate what a complicated project this this is, and noted that the team moved quickly on to other projects. Well, I think uh, all those on from the alliance would agree with that. It was um, we moved swiftly on to another uh, job that was delivered in February, basically at Lookers, which was if you think of the mobilisation involved at Christmas, and then two months later you're you're doing it all again somewhere else. Uh, and also the the weather to consider as well, uh, doing these two jobs. So, yeah, quite an achievement. Any any further comments to be added to the chat at all? What I can do then is uh, I should be able to release the the mics if I can do that. Bear with me. Unmute all. Okay, so I think if anyone wants to add any comments, you can just unmute yourself now. I think it was locked beforehand, so feel free to, to un, unmute yourself and ask any other questions. No. Greg, I, Jim, Jim Watson here. I, can, can I say to our, our three presenters, thank you very much. Absolutely brilliant to hear a presentation on what is probably an absolute horror of horror renewals. <laughs> I'm glad to say I'm in semi-retirement. I wouldn't like to have uh, either planned or implemented that one, but 
well done, guys. Uh, I think you did really, really well. And very, very difficult uh, and constrained circumstances. Actually, I wonder, Jim, okay, Jim, Jim, I wonder, Jim, if you'd maybe renewed it last time round. No, no, it wasn't me. I, I, I don't know if he's on here tonight. I, but one, one, of, one of my colleagues and a, a former colleagues, Colin Ness, I, I, I did send him the link, and I hope he is on here tonight. He was present last time around. Uh, Willie Burrell, I don't know if he's on tonight. Again, another gentleman who was involved in last time round in the mid 80s. Uh, it would be interesting to hear if they are on tonight and uh, if they have anything to comment on. Yeah. I believe Malcolm Swan was mentioning it as well. He was on it 30 years ago. Greg, it's Eric Ryder. I was on it uh, 36 years ago. It was my first uh, weekend as the PWME or whatever the name was in that junction. So I was really impressed with the presentation. It looks excellent and I hope it lasts another 36 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks for that, Eric. Yep. Yep. Greg, could I, uh, it's Russell Kimber here. How are you doing? Um, could I ask a question, please, uh, from the team about the, the sort of difference between the TAD design and what was on the ground was was it, was there any sort of detail if it was mostly like lateral or was it vertical or was it kind of just as normal kind of bit of both there any, was there any detail I know David was kind yeah. of taking that earlier yeah, yeah. But a bit of both Russell um I, I, yeah. I think the, the vertical was most apparent when you got to I think some station actually um sure. you'd pretty much have to rebuild both platforms completely um, oh, okay. if, you wanted to, if you wanted to implement the TAD, but through the junction itself, it was lateral and vertical. Um, it was quite yeah. quite a big departure, really. Sure. And was there any kind of thoughts? Was it a kind of enthusiastic tamping, or was it going to maybe lack off or a bit? <laughs> um, any thoughts on that at all? I got the impression, uh, speaking to the guys at Milton Keynes, I got the impression that the further north you go, particularly towards the extremity, um, I think Newton East Junction is the end. Um, the, the, the TAD has never ever been implemented, so it's a sort of theoretical uh, alignment. Okay. Yeah, Actually, it's yeah. it's smoother, it's smoother than what what's existing, and um, but it doesn't bear much relation to what's on the ground. <laughs> sure, sure, that's interesting. Thanks, David. No problem. I just wanted to point out there as well. So we've got a comment from from Banu um, on the on the on the chat there, and it just it's something we probably never mentioned, or, or the guys would. Would I'm sure love to mention is that we're also supported on this job. Um, although I'm not a presenter tonight, I was a CEM for the job as well. But I have to say thanks to our team in GEC, uh, as a part of our team out in India, who also yep. worked really hard on this job. And, and Banu's just doing a good, good job team, and it was a great presentation, and good learning for him. But I'm sure the main learning was was <laughs> the blood, sweat, and tears he put into the to the job as well. So thanks very much. Um, Greg, um, David, um, hi there. What a great presentation, guys, and um, really a lot, a lot of things to learn from it. Um, well, my question is um, probably to you, David. Um, I know there was, I know Satish mentioned there was a lot of bridges, a lot of structures. Did that have any effect at all, like in the constraint type of? Um, I would say, was there any effect to the to the structures? While doing your clearances or any anything that you came up with, no, we didn't the... have any issue. No, no issue with, with gauging. Um, we, um, the, one of the bridges in particular is extremely high. Um, yep. The one that's closest to the junction you can see in the picture there. Uh, yep. Another yep. one is closer. <laughs> uh, and the other one is closer to the Ellington Station itself. But both of them are well clear. You often find on electrified sites that that's the case. Uh, thankfully, that wasn't wasn't an issue that we had. I think so. Yeah. The, the only thing uh, we were wondering about was uh, the sloot on the holy down lines was towards the re retaining wall, and uh, we were wondering if it is going to reduce the window clearance for the uh, Woyley mast there. But, but uh, it was working out okay. Everything was okay. Yeah, in terms of clearances. So no, there was also there was also a question mark whether or not we were making a 
an area of limited clearance um, that didn't already already exist. So we had to look into that, but it turns out it's already it was already uh, deemed as being limited clearance. And um, just one thing else um, before you finish up the presentation, in regards to looking at the site there, there's a lot of vegetation there um, and a lot of environmental stuff there. So was that was that any constraints at all? Any environmental issues at all over the vegetation? You know, like regrowing. You know, is was that causing any 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 habitat in it in, in around the area? The main yeah. environmental consideration yeah. was the uh, Japanese knotweed. Um, the in terms of the overgrowth and the vegetation, there was a program that came through Odingston run about five six months before we did the job. Uh, I think it was QTS that did it. And they actually took a lot of the the overgrowth off the the top of the sheep piles, um, but in terms of environment, there wasn't anything like badgers or anything like that. They're just up the road at Rolliven, um, but we did have, obviously have the the impact to the Japanese knotweed. Brilliant. Thank you, Liam, and that's well, me really, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for that, Shreep. Uh, just um, in case anyone wants to think of a, a last question, I'll just read out another comment there from, from Mark Taylor. He was saying a relatively hassle-free project, and thanks to, to the guys for making it that bit easier to project engineer. So thanks for that, Mark. Okay. Um, last chance for any other questions before we, we move on. I'm sure the guys will stay on even once, once we close out, if anyone thinks anything. Um, in the meantime, I'm, I can I ask Jim Watson to give the vote of thanks on behalf of the members, please? Okay, Greg, I, I think I've successfully uh, unmuted my mic. Uh, first <laughs> of have. all, David, uh, Satish and Liam, thank you very much for uh, taking the opportunity to, 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 to enlighten us tonight on uh, what was a very significant uh, track renewal project. I'm sure uh, a lot of people out there do not really appreciate just what a big job this was. Uh, before going on uh, any further, I, th I, I, I would like to actually thank uh, or, or David for uh, recently deciding to uh, professionally register with the PWI and congratulations, David. You're now a, pro a professionally registered uh, engineering technician with the, the PWI. Great stuff. More people need to do what you've done. Um, as, as, as far as the presentation tonight is concerned, I'm actually overwhelmed. Uh, in some ways, I, I'm delighted to be almost retired from the what a uh, the realms of uh, permanent way renewals, because this was your job from hell, and <laughs> the three of you have successfully delivered that job from hell. Um, a complex job and very, very difficult topography. A wet site, water, of course, is always the enemy of the PW engineer. Um, the the sheet pile walls have influenced greatly the insulation technology methodology, and uh, you've overcome that. Early drainage, dry out the site, great stuff. Geocells, now that's an interesting one. That's something that we did in the 80s and into the 90s, and then decided it wasn't a good idea because it took too long, it cost us too much, but we're back to using them. So I. Uh, that tells us something. It's a good idea. Uh, you mentioned the, 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 the use of carrows and the double split, combining the use of tilting wagons uh, and, and road delivery. There's only so many tilting wagons to go around. Uh, I, I remember well back in the early 2000s uh, attending a meeting down in uh, the ivory towers at Euston uh, when tilting wagons and modular s &C were first discussed. Uh, Andrew McNaughton said, you guys in Scotland and Wales will never see these tilting wagons. Well, we did, <laughs> but uh, we, we, we made the best of it. We, we, we've seen them in a limited uh, fashion, 
But here, you've made the best of both worlds. You've used tilting wagons, you've used road delivery, great stuff. Um, you've had uh, significant constraints in this site, uh, both from the point of view of construction and design. You've had a station just off the job. Um, you've had fixed structures, but uh, yet you've overcome these these issues. Uh, the NR60, NR56 issue with the uh, switch design, a uh, switch diamonds. Yeah, uh, good good bit of design going in there. Uh, overcome the obstacles, um, and uh, great, you made it work at the end of the day. Um, this, this this junction was was, was considered, uh, if you like, st state of the art back in the 80s, and you brought it into state of the art in the 21st century. Uh, you've overcome interdisciplinary uh, challenges, uh, clashes, the old uh, issues with uh, both signalling and, and and overhead line. You've overcome that absolutely brilliant, and uh, I, I'm I'm really pleased to see. What we have here is uh, the alliance working to provide a process that overcomes the interdisciplinary issues and the construction issues. Translating design to construction, absolutely wonderful. Uh, I, I appreciate we're, we, we're here in a, a virtual world, but I would uh, now ask uh, our members to join with me in showing our thanks to the three presenters tonight, uh, who have done absolutely wonderfully in uh, presenting this in the usual way. <clears throat> Thank, well thanks for that, Jim. That was great. Um, I'm, for anyone, I'm just going to stop.